स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Let's do some problems on uh, applications of Silos theorem. Of uh, all three Silos theorems, application of the Silos theorems. Okay, so here's uh, the first problem. Suppose G is a finite group whose cardinality is 12. Okay, then prove that, um, prove that. So maybe we should uh, give it Silo uh, subgroup a name as well. So let H denote a silo three a three silo subgroup of G. So 12 of course is uh, 3 into 4. So that's 3 into 2 square. That's the prime factorization. And uh, so by Silo's theorem, we know that uh, there is a three silo subgroup, which is basically a subgroup whose cardinality is 3 power 1. Uh, so pick any such subgroup and call it H. So then the what we need to prove is the following then uh, prove the following either H is normal either H is normal in G. So it's a normal subgroup or uh, the group G is isomorphic to A4. Okay, so this is what we need to prove. Either the 3 silo subgroup is normal in this group or the group itself is isomorphic to the group A4. Okay, so let us um, work out the solution to this problem. First, uh, let us recall what the group A4 was. So what is A4? This is the what we call the alternating group. So you encountered this once before the alternating group on four letters. Uh, how was it uh, defined? So if you look back on the lecture on normal subgroups, uh, you will recall that this was defined as follows. Uh, so in general, I take Sn or in this case, let us do it for this case. I take the symmetry group S4 of all permutations. And I can actually map this to the group uh, of all, so let us call it GL4, uh, C maybe, complex 4 cross 4 complex matrices um, which are invertible. And how do I do it? I take each uh, permutation sigma in S4 and map it to the corresponding permutation matrix. So recall we have what is called the permutation matrix associated to each permutation. And how do you get it? Well, you start with the identity matrix, right? So I have the identity matrix uh, whose columns are 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, etc. So that is my identity. And then the permutation matrix of sigma does the following. It takes the columns of this identity matrix and permutes it, permutes these columns according to the permutation sigma, okay? So I sort of have to just permute my columns according to what sigma does. Okay, uh, so this is just something for you to recall if you look back on the lecture on normal subgroups. So uh, this is a homomorphism of groups mapping a permutation to the corresponding permutation matrix and I can further look at the determinant map. So I can further compute the determinant of each uh, permutation matrix. Turns out it is either plus 1 or minus 1 in general. So the determinant actually maps to 
So the determinant is a map uh, which takes an invertible matrix to a non-zero complex number, so which I will denote as C uh, with a cross on top. So this is the set of all non-zero, the multiplicative group of non-zero complex numbers. And the um, <clears throat> so if you sort of take this uh, composition of these two maps to each sigma, you associate the determinant of its permutation matrix and uh, so you get a homomorphism and the kernel of that entire homomorphism. So kernel, so how did we define the alternating group? Here's one way of defining it is nothing but the kernel of the homomorphism from S4 to the multiplicative group of complex numbers where this homomorphism is defined by saying each sigma maps to the determinant of the permutation matrix of sigma. Okay, so this was how it was defined. So kernel of, uh, so in this case, the multiplicative group of complex numbers, non-zero complex numbers, it's, it has identity uh, being the number one. So what we are saying is it's all permutation matrices whose determinant is plus one. Okay. So of course, this is one way of defining it. Another uh, way of defining it is to say uh, somewhat more uh, concrete, easier to understand. Uh, we say that this alternating group is nothing but the set of what are called even permutations of 1, 2, 3, 4. So what is the set of even permutations? So recall that uh, any permutation sigma, so if sigma is an element of S4, any permutation can always be written as a product of transpositions. Okay, so what's a transposition? A transposition is just uh, a permutation of the form ij, which means that uh, it leaves all the other numbers fixed and it sends i to j and j to i. Okay, so that's a transposition. So this sort of permutation is what we call a transposition. And uh, it's a fact that any any uh, permutation can be written as a product of transpositions. Okay, this is in general. Uh, we say that a permutation is even if it can be written as a product of an even number of transpositions. Okay, so we say that. So this is the definition. Sigma is said to be an even. Is Uh, an even permutation if sigma can be written as a product of an even number of transpositions. And turns out that this is another way of saying the same thing. The determinant is plus one uh, is the same as saying that sigma can be written as a product of an even number of transpositions. Okay, uh, and the other important fact about A4 is that uh, the cardinality of A4 is exactly half the cardinality of the entire symmetric group S4. So S4 is four factorial cardinality, which is 24. And so this is 24 by 2, which is exactly 12. Okay. Now, um, let's look at uh, what we need to prove. We are given uh, the 3 silo subgroup is, is called H. And so we know let H be what's given. This was a 3 silo subgroup. And since the cardinality of G was 3 power 1 into 2 power 2, the cardinality of H will just be 3 power 1, the maximum power of 3 which divides uh, uh, the cardinality of G. Okay, now what we need to prove, let us look back on what we need to prove, either H is normal or G is A4. Okay, so let us let us do it as follows. Let us assume that H is not normal. Uh, suppose H is not normal.
okay we will we will show we need to prove that the group then is isomorphic to a4 okay so this is our our goal let's try and use the silo theorems so we'll use for a start let's look at the third silo theorem so we'll first apply silo theorem number 3 um, what does this say? It talks about the number of three silo subgroups. So let M denote the number of three silo subgroups. Uh, what the third silo theorem says is that this number is congruent to one modulo three. Okay, what that means is that it can take one of the following values it can be 1 4 7 10 etc right it's one of these possible numbers numbers congruent to 1 modulo 3 okay now uh, let's try and understand this 3 silo subgroup a little better so suppose if i have two 3 silo subgroups so i have h prime if h prime and h double prime are uh, both three silo subgroups okay, are two distinct three silo subgroups then uh, what does that mean let us try and draw a picture so I have H prime what does it have it is uh, got an element E let us call the other two elements as A and A square it is a group of order 3 so it has got to be cyclic. Now I take H double prime which is another such guy. Now the point is that these two subgroups if they are distinct then this automatically means that their intersection has to only be the identity. So I can only get H double prime looking like this. There should be another B and a B square. Okay, why is this? Because well their intersection is after all another subgroup. Right. The intersection of two subgroups is a subgroup and this is a subgroup of both H prime and H double prime if you wish and it is got to be a proper subgroup because uh, H prime and H double prime are two distinct um, distinct sets or, or they are not equal to each other. So, this intersection has to be a proper subgroup of H prime okay. but H prime has cardinality 3 and so if you have a proper subgroup then that is only got to be cardinality 1 ok. So, this uh, tells us that any two of these three silo subgroups they must intersect in this manner they have to have the identity common but the other two elements are, are separate meaning they have no intersections ok. So, what does that tell us in particular? So, if you look at what each three silo subgroup therefore contributes there is the identity and then there are two elements of order 3. So, observe this a, a square, b, b square and so on they are all elements of order 3 right because the group has order 3 ok. So, what is a, a subgroup a 3 silo subgroup contribute there is one identity and two elements of order 3 these are both elements of order 3. Similarly, if I take the other 3 silo subgroup here it is got these two elements whose order is 3 ok and so on. So, in general I claim the uh, a little observation here is that the number of elements of order 3 the number of elements of G of order 3 is exactly 2 times the number of 3 silo subgroups M ok. I claim that this must be true. Okay. So, um, uh, a moment's thought should convince you that this is in fact right. Uh, why is this? Because if I well on the one hand we have just said that if I take a 3 silo subgroup it contributes 2 elements of order 3 okay. and these elements are all distinct. If I take 2 different uh, 3 silo subgroups sort of intersecting each other I get 2 elements of order 3 from one guy 2 other elements of order 3 from the other subgroup. So, it is clear that there are at least these many elements of order 3 in my group ok. But if on the other hand if I have an element of order 3 then it generates a cyclic group of order 3 
okay, which is automatically a, a three silo subgroup. Okay, so any element of order three necessarily belongs to some three silo subgroup. Okay, so I sort of orally described the argument, but uh, I'd like you to try and formulate this into into a rigorous sequence of steps. So proof exercise. Okay. So now we, we sort of understand what these three silo subgroups are good for. They contribute elements of order three. They contribute two elements of order three each. And so now we, we already said what are the possible values of M. They can be 1, 4, 7, 10 and so on. But we can already see that 7, 10 and so on are all not possible values. So I cannot have M equals 7 because if M is 7, that will tell me that there must be 14 elements of order three in my group but my group itself is only of order order 12. Okay, so all these numbers 7 and higher will turn out to be not possible. They cannot be values of M because they will tell us that there are too many elements of order 3 in my group. Okay, so observe that uh, M has to be 1 or 4 since uh, the group itself. So since 2M, the total number of elements of order 3 can at most be the cardinality of the group okay? and the cardinality of the group is 12. So this uh, tells us that M is at most 6 for example and among the possible values 1 and 4 are the only ones which satisfy this inequality. Okay, So there are two possibilities M is either 1 or 4 and uh, let us see which of these is indeed possible. If M is actually 1, what does this mean? This means that there exists only one three silo subgroup. So there exists a unique three silo subgroup. Okay, but what does this mean? So recall all three silo subgroups are, are mutually conjugate if you wish that is the second uh, silo theorem. Uh, so in this case, so H, so this, this H is the unique we already gave it a name, we picked one of them and called it H, H is the unique 3 silo subgroup. Now what does that mean? If I conjugate H by any element of the group, that is again a 3 silo subgroup because its cardinality is 3, but there is only one 3 silo subgroup which is H itself. So this must be true, the conjugate, any conjugate of H must coincide with H. Okay, because any conjugate of H is also a 3 silo subgroup. This is also 3 silo. Okay, now, what does that imply? That tells you that H is normal. Okay, every conjugate coincides with the group itself, the subgroup itself. Okay, but we had assumed to start with that H is not normal. That was our hypothesis. Okay, so, that implies that therefore, M cannot be 1. So, this case cannot arise. So we conclude therefore that M must be 4. So the final conclusion here is that there are exactly 4 3 silo subgroups in my group G. Okay. So let us see uh, what that will give us. So let us try and draw the, the same sort of picture that we drew before on how many um, uh, elements there are of, of each of, of order 3. So let me draw my four three silo subgroups like this. So here's my three silo subgroup identity uh, a a square, b identity, and then two more elements b b square. So this is my identity element. So here's a third of the subgroups identity c c square. So I'm just drawing my three silo subgroups c c square. identity d d square. Okay. So these are all my three silo subgroups. I have four of them and this accounts for uh, 8 plus 1, 9 elements of my group. So I know there are three more elements left. So what does my group look like? There are three more elements left in my group. So what I have drawn here is a picture of my group G itself. Okay. So think of this as my group G now. Sort of have some understanding about uh, the orders of the various elements, for example. Okay, uh, so of course I am saying a cubed, b cubed, c cubed, and d cubed are all equal to the identity. So maybe let us call that 1 instead of e. So they are all equal to 1. 
Okay, now um, what is it that we now need to prove? We need to show that the group G is isomorphic to A4, right? That was our, our objective. Now, uh, why should this group be isomorphic to A4? In general, when you're trying to prove statements like this, that a group is isomorphic to say maybe some symmetric group even, or a group is isomorphic to some subgroup of a symmetric group, the way one, one tries to establish facts like that is by constructing an action of this group G on a set whose cardinality is four, for example. So in, in our example, so what we want to prove, we want to prove that G is isomorphic to A4. A4 remember is some subgroup of the symmetric group S4. When you want to do a thing like this, we will do it as follows. Uh, we construct an action we will construct an action of the group G on uh, a set X with four elements. Okay. Now, why does that help us? Why should we try and do it in this manner? Um, how, how does that help? Because uh, recall from the, the earlier set of problems that uh, we did, uh, group actions can be thought of in an, in an alternative way. If a group G acts on a set X, so recall when I have this, this means I can, I obtain a group homomorphism from the group G to the group of all permutations of X, okay, or all bijections from X to X. And if you recall, how was this map defined? Uh, each group element G was mapped to a certain permutation called phi sub G, where phi sub G was defined as follows. Phi sub G is a permutation of X, which is just uh, G phi G of X is G acting on X for all X and X. Okay. So this is a group homomorphism. So phi is a group homomorphism. Uh, recall given a group action, there exists a group homomorphism. Okay, so if I construct a group, uh, an action on a set of four elements, then what I will get at least is a homomorphism from my group G to the set of all permutations of a set of four elements. Okay, and permutations of a set of four elements is is like S four. Right, so it's the the symmetric group. So at least we will get a map, a homomorphism from G to S4, and we will then try and prove that this homomorphism is uh, one to one, and its image is exactly A4. Okay, that's the idea. That's going to be the strategy. Okay. Now, uh, how do we how do we construct this this set X? So. Um, So in, in this case, firstly, let's look for a set of four elements. It turns out the, the correct object to take, I mean, there are many, many possibilities, but the correct object to take is what I have denoted in this diagram here, uh, is the set of these four subgroups. Okay, There are four three silo subgroups and this four element set, which comprises these four subgroups is what I need to take. Okay. So let's let's make that precise. So let's take x. So I'm going to define x. Define x as follows. Be the set of three silo subgroups. Of G. So I know there are exactly four of them. Okay. Now let's construct an action of G on x. That's easy too. That's it's sort of natural. We just take the conjugation action. So what do we mean by that? Uh, we just take G acting on any one of the silo subgroups. Will just give me G H prime G inverse. The conjugate of that guy. Okay, and uh, the what silo theorem two tells us? Silo two tells us that all the silo subgroups are mutually conjugate to each other, right? 
So what Scylla 2 tells us is that this action is transitive. In other words, that, that there is a unique orbit. Okay. Scylla 2 says that uh, there exists a single orbit in this case. or to use a word which we introduced in the earlier problem session i.e. Uh, this action is transitive, this action is transitive. Okay. So, the conjugation action on the set of three silo subgroups is, uh, is transitive according to the second silo theorem and that is a, that's a set of uh, four elements. Now, let us see if, if that gives us what we want. So, now by, by our earlier principle, by the general principle I just talked about, which implies I get a, a group homomorphism, let us call it phi from G to the set of all permutations of X. Okay, and the permutations of X, as I just said, is like the symmetric group S4 because S, uh, X has exactly four elements. Now, let us try and establish the following facts. Claim phi is an injective map. In other words, it is 1 to 1 and the image of phi is, is exactly A4, okay, it is isomorphic to the uh, subgroup A4 of S4. Okay, so, let us see how uh, we would establish these two facts. So, proof of claim. Um, Recall from the problem that we did last time, from the earlier problem session, that we actually know how to compute the kernel of this homomorphism phi. Okay. So, the kernel of this, this homomorphism, when you have a group action and you consider the corresponding homomorphism, the kernel of that homomorphism, we said is nothing but the intersection of all the stabilizers. Okay. So, I have to compute the, the stabilizer of, of all the various um, elements of x in this case. Now, uh, what is that? So, this is just the intersection of the stabilizer of h prime, let us say h prime is any one of the four uh, uh, three cello subgroups. Okay. And uh, what does stabilizer now mean? Stabilizer by definition for the conjugation action where when I say this stabilizer, so I am just using this notation stab for stabilizer, stabilizer of H prime by definition is all those group elements which act on H prime and leave it fixed. Okay, so, G H prime G inverse is, is should equal H prime and this is what we usually call the normalizer. So, this has another name. This is sometimes called the normalizer of the subgroup H prime. Okay, in general, the normalizer of a subgroup is nothing but the stabilizer uh, of that subgroup under the, the conjugation action. Okay, so uh, we we are talking about the the normalizers in this case. Okay, now uh, let's see what what else can we can we conclude about uh, the stabilizers. So uh, recall from the orbit, you know the the counting theorem, not the one which counts orbits, but the cardinality of an orbit. So recall uh, how does one find the orbit of H prime? the orbit stabilizer theorem. So, the orbit is related to the stabilizer in this way, right. That is how we find the stabilizers if you, I mean at least the cardinalities, if you know the cardinality of the orbit that determines the cardinality of the stabilizer. Now, observe in this case, we know the, the cardinality of the orbit, right. The orbit as we just said, it is a transitive action. So, all four uh, silo subgroups are uh, in the same orbit. So, if I start with any h prime and I apply the conjugation action, I get all the other uh, three silo subgroups. So, the orbit is equal to uh, the entire set x, cardinality is 4 and cardinality g is 12. So, from this I conclude that the stabilizer of h prime must have cardinality 3. Okay, but here is the, the important observation 
uh, from the definition it is all those elements which uh, when you conjugate with h prime they give you back h prime. This certainly contains h prime at least h prime certainly is inside this right because if I take g to be an element of h prime and I conjugate by uh, that element g of course the answer will lie again in h prime right if g itself is in h prime g h prime g inverse is also in h prime. So, the normalizer of a, of a subgroup certainly contains the subgroup itself. Now, the subgroup of course has cardinality 3 as well. Okay? So, what does this say? We have just concluded that the stabilizer of H prime has cardinality 3, but on the other hand the stabilizer contains the original subgroup H prime whose cardinality is also 3. Okay? So, what is the conclusion? It just means this can only happen if the stabilizer is H prime itself. So, for any 3 silo subgroup we also conclude the following fact that its normalizer is itself okay, the, or the stabilizer for the conjugation action. Okay, so, what does that uh, give us? It, determine, it helps us determine the kernel. So, why did I get here? Because I was trying to say I can try and determine the kernel of this map. Right? So, I need to find this out that is the intersection of all the stabilizers. Now, I know what the stabilizers are. So, therefore, conclusion the kernel of this map phi is nothing but the intersection of all the stabilizers h prime running over all the four subgroups, but the stabilizers are themselves h primes. Okay, and this as we know is just in fact, if you intersect any two of them, it gives you the identity. So, of course, if you intersect all four, you get the identity itself. Right, that is clear from our, our picture. So, the intersection of these four subgroups is only the identity element. Okay, so, what does that mean? It says that the kernel is just the identity which means that phi is injective. So, this part is now done. Right? So, I, I just concluded here that this is this of course means that phi is injective. Okay, uh, already we are in good shape. So, let us look at the second part of the proposition which is we need to show that the the image of phi is going to be uh, isomorphic to a4 okay now uh, this is again uh, 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 an interesting argument which is that uh, so let's look at the the map phi itself so we look at the the order 3 elements of g Okay, so, what I have here is a group homomorphism from G to uh, the group S4 or the group of permutations and I know, now know that phi is an injective map. So, let me look at the order 3 elements of G. Right? So, somehow I am basing all my intuition on, on the fact that I know what the order 3 elements are. So, there are these 8 elements whose order is 3. Let me look at where they will map under this homomorphism phi. So, let us look at the images of these, these order 3 elements. So, there are, so recall there are 8 order 3 elements which are a, a square, b, b square, etcetera in G. Observe that since phi is injective, their images under phi are also of order 3, their images under phi okay, are also or are well what are they they are now order 3 elements of f of s4 now right of s4 or s4 which is the permutations of x okay so at least i know that uh, there are uh, i am trying to understand what the image looks like i know at least this much that the image has these uh, eight order 3 elements Okay, and why is this? Because if an element has some order, see if, if uh, x, um, we will call it something else, maybe if uh, I have an element a whose order is, is d in general, if a power d is identity and I apply a group homomorphism, this tells me that phi of a power d is, is also identity, but this is phi a whole power d. Okay? Now, what that means is that the order of phi a divides d in general, but the order of phi a since phi is injective it also means that 
you know d if d is the smallest number such that a power d is 1 then d must also be the smallest number such that phi a d is 1 okay if not it will imply that phi you know phi is not injective okay so uh, an injective map preserves orders so that's what i wanted to say here um, let me uh, let me get rid of this let me just go on so the image is under phi that's what i want to understand there are eight elements of order 3 okay now let's let's look at uh, the the symmetric group s4 itself and ask what are the elements of order 3 in s4 what do they look like okay and uh, question what do the elements of order 3 in what are the elements what are the elements of order 3 in the group s4 okay, and the answer is uh, lies in in uh, trying to understand the various cycle types so let's uh, recall what are the various possible cycle types of elements of s4 so these are cycle types in s4 uh, you can have say the element <coughs> the identity element whose cycle type is 1 2 3 4 or i can have a two cycle and two one cycles i can have two two cycles or i can have an element which is a three cycle with a one cycle or a four cycle so these are the five possible um, cycle types and in each case it's very easy to see what the order of an element is of that cycle type so let's tabulate the orders so if a, if an element is identity of course it has order one so this is order one uh, this is a transposition so i mean if i square this element i will get identity this again it's a product of two transpositions if i i mean which commute with each other here again if i square this element i get uh, the identity now in this case uh, here is a, a three cycle so if i cube this element i get the identity so the order is three and this element has order four okay so here's the interesting bit that there's actually exactly one possible way in which you can get uh, an element of order 3 one possible cycle type which will give you uh, order 3 and that cycle type is 3 cycle with 1 cycle okay so what we conclude therefore is that these 8 elements that we know uh, which lie in the image of phi these 8 elements must have this as their cycle structure okay it's got to be 1 2 3 with a 4 3 cycle but uh, the the proof more or less is done now the key point is that elements of this cycle structure must all be even permutations okay are necessarily even permutations that's what we're going to claim so observe now that the eight elements of order three in the image must have cycle type like this 1 2 3 4 okay so in other words uh, so have the cycle type meaning they should all look like so uh, every one of these eight elements therefore looks like some three cycle i j k l let's say okay where i j k l are some 1 2 3 4 in some order so this is what any 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 one of these eight elements every one of them has this form okay now the key point is suppose i take an element of this form this can be written as the the product of the following transpositions so i can write this as um, let me get the order right so this is ij uh, ij into jk so this is the product of the transpositions ij and jk and l of course is is not a transposition so it, it's a fixed point so observe when i write sigma as a product of transpositions i get exactly two transpositions there's ij and jk and so which means that sigma is an even permutation an even permutation in other words it belongs to a4 therefore sigma belongs to a4 okay now what does that tell us so it tells us that if i like look at the image of phi image of this homomorphism it was an injective homomorphism and i i want to prove that the image is is exactly a4 but at least I know this that there are eight elements inside this image. 
the image of phi intersection a, a4 at least these these eight elements are certainly in a4 okay now again it's a, it's a simple counting argument solves left so this guy observe is however a subgroup this is the image of a homomorphism is a subgroup so this is therefore an intersection of two subgroups of s4 so this is a subgroup of a4 if you wish this is a subgroup of a4 uh, it's a subgroup whose cardinalities are at least 8 now observe a4 has cardinality 12 okay which means that this this subgroup should have cardinality which divides 12 okay this is a subgroup of a4 which implies has cardinality which divides 12 which means it's 1 2 3 4 6 or 12 these are the only possibilities has cardinality belonging to this set okay but we know it's at least 8 because of this this previous argument which means that all the other possibilities don't exist none of these is possible the cardinality has to be actually 12 this means that uh, image phi intersection a4 has to have cardinality 12 in other words it's it's equal to a4 image phi intersect a4 intersect a4 equals a4 okay that means that the image contains a4 but the the size so recall however that the cardinality of the image of phi is the same as the cardinality of the original group G okay, because what was this phi phi was an injective map from G to S4 to the set of permutations of X right so phi was an injective map so it the if G has cardinality 12 then of course the image of G under phi also has cardinality 12 so this guy actually has exactly cardinality 12 okay so it has cardinality 12 and on the other hand the image contains the group A4 whose cardinality is also 12 which means that these are actually equal to each other. So, the image of phi is in fact equal to A4. Okay? So, if you identify the permutations with S4 in any which way, what we have shown is that the image is exactly the subgroup A4. Okay? So, that completes the um, the thing that we set out to prove that either H is normal or if not the group itself is isomorphic to the group A4. Okay? So, along the way we have had occasion to use many different facts that we have learned until now about uh, groups and actions and homomorphisms and so on. Okay. Mm -hmm.